Ready, so we'll get started. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Alan Jude. Today we're going to talk about supporting FreeBSD in the field and what we as the developers and other users in the community around FreeBSD can learn from those who use it in production but maybe don't come out to the conference to kind of tell us some of their stories. Uh, so yes, as I said, I'm Alan Jude. I'm the FreeBSD engineering manager uh, at Clara where we do FreeBSD and ZFS yeah. development. Uh, so quickly going over the agenda for today, we'll start with the introductions that I've already started, and then we'll look at why some of our customers chose to use FreeBSD over the alternatives, and then we'll talk about some interesting and maybe complicated problems that we've helped them solve, uh, and then get into the lessons we learned from that and what we as a, the open source projects can take away from that and, and improve what we do and make it easier for more people to adopt FreeBSD or other BSDs. And then I have some more stories to share, just you know, interesting war stories from trying to use FreeBSD in the field. Uh, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, so I think one of the most important lessons uh, in life that's borne out by this presentation is you want to ignore most of what people say and instead observe what they do. Uh, even, you know, as developers is often kind of the difference between do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> because we often perpetrate all kinds of crimes against computing uh, for our own stuff, but expect everybody else to do it the right way. Uh, and yeah, one of the most useful bits of feedback as a developer or, of, or a maintainer is to actually sit and watch someone use your software. Uh, you know, when I worked on FreeBSD's installer, um, I had it down and I thought it was all very easy to use and there were no confusing parts to it at all. And then I was in the hacker lounge, and sat down someone relatively new to BSD in front of a laptop and watched them go through the installer and, you know, come up with many, many paper cuts uh, and, you know, confused looks on their face and so on. I was like, okay, this is not anywhere near as easy as I thought it was. I assumed too much knowledge that I had that, you know, the average person sitting down in front of this installer doesn't have. Uh, and so, again, by observing how other people use the software, we can see where we made the correct choice not as obvious as we thought we did, or just underdocumented something, or just left something in a state that wasn't maybe the best for everyone. Uh, so quickly, an overview of, of what Clara does, as that will frame a lot of the, the conversation as we go on. So Clara provides professional services for FreeBSD and OpenZFS. Uh, so the majority of that is development. So we build whole features for the kernel and, and other bits of FreeBSD and ZFS, uh, and then upstream those, as well as selling support subscriptions and doing maintenance and, and other work around those projects to help companies and entities cooperate with the community and, and get the most out of FreeBSD in their environment and give back. Um, you know, there are companies that want to give back but not being familiar with the community, don't know how, and we help bridge that for them. And then Clara also does community work and advocacy. So just the articles we put on our website and the other bits we do to expose more of the world to FreeBSD. Uh, you know, we went to the open source firmware conference and we're talking about, you know, you, uh, not everything needs to be based on Linux uh, and so on. So, to start, we'll talk about why some of our customers ended up choosing FreeBSD as the platform for their appliance or product or service or whatever. So the biggest factor is often stability. Um, the fact that when you build something on top of FreeBSD, the APIs and the, the way it works isn't going to change out from under you every new release. Uh, you know, we have customers building things on top of Linux and then oh, that API is the deprecated one now, you need to use this other one. Or we made that symbol GPL only now, so you're kind of just out of luck. <laughs> the other is obviously the license. Uh, for a lot of companies, that is a deciding factor. You know, the GPL, especially the V3, has clauses that make it just incompatible with trying to build a product out of it. Number three is interesting, is just diversity. Some companies have a policy that 
they want to avoid monocultures or single points of failure. And for some of them, it, if, if everything they do is based on Linux, then Linux becomes a single point of failure. And so building diversity by having some fraction of their infrastructure run not Linux, um, and then also maybe always using two different daemons for their important service so that if there's a bug in the kernel in one operating system or in one of those daemons, a quarter of their infrastructure that's running those different combinations will still be available and their service won't be out just because of uh, a critical bug in a certain kernel or a certain daemon. And fourth is the time to market. The fact that if you use FreeBSD to build an appliance, you can have an appliance you can ship a lot sooner than if you use something else. Uh, FreeBSD has all these niceties and pre-built pieces that you can stand up an appliance really quickly. Uh, and we even saw some of that at the Dev Summit with Antithesis talking about the fact that they could just take this and build on top of it, already have a hypervisor, even though they were customizing it and doing a lot of different things, if they tried to do it from scratch, they couldn't have managed to put it together in a reasonable amount of time. So digging into this a little further, uh, have kind of a use case slash case study story about long-term stability. So one of our customers is a uh, you know, consumer electronics brand you've heard of before, and they make a video on demand appliance that goes in hotel rooms that allows you to pay money to rent a movie to watch in your hotel room. And their appliance was based on CentOS. But with the change from CentOS 6 to CentOS 7, they had to rewrite all of their services and scripts and, and all, everything to use systemd instead of not systemd that CentOS 6 was. And so they went through all that pain, uh, but we're not very happy about it. Uh, but they finally got all the way there, and then IBM or Red Hat announced that, oh, CentOS 7 isn't gonna have long-term support anymore. Uh, so good luck with that, I guess. Uh, and so after already being upset about the whole systemd thing, and then having the LTS yanked out from under them, they decided it's time to switch to FreeBSD. And so now that appliance is shipped and deployed into hotels and runs FreeBSD instead. Mostly luckily because the, the video processing happens on an FPGA that connects over IP, so they didn't need to even rewrite a custom driver for the, the video IP uh, because it was connected over the network. Then in another example, uh, an aeronautics company had built a reliable IP communication driver. So they have network links that have to, the message has to get through no matter what. Problem with using something like BGP for that is, there can be windows of a couple of minutes while it's still reconverging where, you know, packets don't actually make it to the other side. And when you're dealing with airplanes, uh, you really want the message to definitely get to the other side. Um, so they built a system that basically duplicates the packets across a number of separate links and then deduplicates them on the other side and make sure, you know, only one copy of the message gets through, but the message always gets through even if some of the links are out. And they had done all this for CentOS, but then the network APIs kept changing on them as they, Linux invented the new, new, new way to do uh, networking properly. And then again and again. And then Red Hat got bought by IBM, and this aeronautics company had a history with IBM and is like, no, we're not going there. <laughs> and so they switched to FreeBSD, and we helped them port the driver uh, for their custom hardware, and now that appliance runs FreeBSD. Uh, we also had to add support for some of their weird authentication protocols and make TACX Plus work properly on FreeBSD. But we did that, it's upstream, everybody's happy. And then we get to the diversity case. As I said, for some customers, they're choosing FreeBSD for no particular reason other than the fact that it's not Linux. It's something other than Linux. And being able to have that mix and avoiding monocultures means that they don't have the same single point of failure. Uh, or, you know, as Star Trek teaches us, you know, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And so just being different
can be enough uh, to make it an interesting choice. But being similar enough that they don't have to relearn everything or that their applications still work is also important. So a different aerospace company is building a satellite communication system and they looked at it and was like, oh, we accidentally used Linux for everything uh, and that's not going to fly, right? We can't have a single point of failure. So let's selectively pick a bunch of these components and switch them over to FreeBSD so that if there's a flaw in one or the other, we're still going to have the other path that still works uh, because really hard to fix a satellite once it's already in space. <laughs> and just the critical infrastructure that runs the core of the internet. It turns out, again, you have to avoid using the same software for everything. Because if that same software has one bug, that can take out everything. And it turns out, you know, you can't just stop having the internet work. Uh, it's like you have one job to keep the internet up. So make sure that it's not all going through, you know, that one toothpick in the XKCD diagram of the infrastructure of the internet. <laughs> and the other is vendor independence. Uh, companies don't want to get caught up in the next hostile takeover. You know, uh, whether it's, oh, we built all of our virtualization on something where, and then it got bought by something com. <laughs> uh, you know, by having some diversity and making sure that we're not all in one place and not using all one technology means that if something happens to that technology, whether it's, you know, even if it seems stable and, and reliable, if it gets acquired or if they pull some license shenanigans and decide this isn't actually open source anymore, this is a business source license or whatever it might be, by having diversity, you have options and some runway to figure things out. Whereas if you're all in on one thing, then you know, when the bad news comes, you're out of options. Uh, as an example for the time to market example, uh, one of our customers is, makes a, a medical device that gets implanted in people uh, and they need to make sure the code that's on it is their code, not somebody else's code. Um, and so they built a whole PKI signing infrastructure. And originally they had done this as a, a cloud appliance, but it turns out when you're manufacturing medical devices, you kind of want the PKI for that to happen air-gapped at the factory when the device is being made. Uh, so we helped them transition their cloud appliance to a physical hardware appliance get all the hardware working, have everything happen there, and build out the right steps for PKI, including how do we make sure this machine is secure. So that was secure boot and very exact going through to make sure that we're only learning loading signed kernels and that you can't load unsigned modules and there aren't rogue binaries running on the system that has the, the keys to you know, control what software runs on this medical implant. And they needed a, a fail-safe upgrade mechanism that would work air-gapped. So how do we you know, deliver securely an update that somebody can then ingest into this machine? How do we deliver a ZFS boot environment in a secure way uh, and make sure that you know, it's got a signed kernel that with our right keys so that the secure boot will only load you know, it will load the new boot environment, but only if we signed it and it's not some other boot environment. And how can we do as much of this as possible without having to customize FreeBSD, right? We want to maintain this long term. So the more things we can use that are built into FreeBSD or that are already upstream or that we can upstream, the less maintenance we'll have because in the end, our appliance is about signing the code and the certificates on this medical device, not about being an operating system. So how do we keep our changes to FreeBSD as minimal as possible so that when it comes to switch to FreeBSD 15, it's as little work as possible? Secure it works quite well. Um, carrying all the way through is a little more difficult. What we ended up, I'm oh, sorry, Repeating the question was, what is the state of secure boot on FreeBSD? Uh, 
So secure boot with EFI will do the right thing. It will only load uh, an EFI loader that is signed. So then you can transition through to very exec to go further than that. Uh, what we did in this specific case was in the loader, we embedded uh, a memory disk, an MD root that contained the slash boot directory in the kernel. Uh, so the kernel, the right modules, and the loader are all built into the EFI loader and live in the ESP. And they're signed with a certificate that the firmware on the hardware knows is valid. And that allows that system to boot. And then we built a feature in ZFS to make a file system immutable. Uh, basically a read-only flag you can set on a file system that you can't turn back off. Uh, this is only enforced by the ZFS kernel module, but because they're using secure boot and then very exec, you can't load a ZFS module that doesn't do this on their hardware. Uh, whereas if you were able to just boot a vanilla FreeBSD on this, you could turn the read-only flag back off, but that can't happen on their hardware because the, the code setting requirements. So that allows them to make a system where they know these binaries will never, they, once they've written them and sealed it, no bit of that will ever change. ZFS will enforce that with the checksums and the, the immutable flag. We did something not as locked down uh, for another industrial automation company where we just made it, FreeBSD will boot from a snapshot, which is read-only and immutable by the nature of ZFS. And then when it's about to transition to the normal rewrite root system, it uses the file system that that snapshot is of, but it rolls back to that snapshot before it becomes writable. So every time you reboot this machine, it throws away any changes since the last reboot. So it's always booting this perfect immutable copy of ZFS. Well, well it's not immutable because you can write to it, but every time you reboot, it goes back to the factory default state. Uh, and for things like kiosks or industrial automation where when it breaks, you just power cycle it and it goes back to being pristine is a, a really useful feature to have. Uh, so now we get to the first part of story time. Uh, you know, solving particularly hard problems, you know, only users could break software this bad or badly. Um, so one we had, it was very interesting, uh, a nonprofit research organization that uses FreeBSD. They're frequently the target of, of foreign state actors trying to get access to the information they have. So in their network, all the FreeBSD machines pixie boot uh, with an, a read-only NFS root so that these machines can't modify the system that they're running. Uh, and that works very well for them. But they have this one server uh, that, unlike the others, would take like 35 minutes to boot. It would just take a really long time as it was trying to do the pixie boot. Uh, and at first they thought, oh, it, it has a real technique, so that's probably the problem. So they replaced it with an Intel one, but still didn't, it made it a little bit better, but it didn't actually solve the problem. Uh, and so Kyle and Tumas, you know, agonized over this for a while and eventually figured out, as is usual, the customer forgot to tell us that one important detail. That particular server was the syslog server. So when it was rebooting, every other machine on the network was still bombarding it with syslog messages. And the pixie loader, being a very rudimentary network implementation in the BIOS boot code, uh, got very confused about getting a lot of messages that had nothing to do with what it was expecting. And when you take uh, a receive, or sorry, when you get a, a transmit interrupt during a, the receive loop, it would end up dropping a packet and then we'd exponential back off and be retrying and trying to just load the kernel over TFTP, UDP, uh, while being flooded with unrelated UDP packets. And it just confused the hell out of the bootloader uh, and made it take a really long time. Uh, so luckily Kyle fixed it uh, and that wasn't a problem anymore. Uh, and so then that server booted again. Although we also had them move the syslog server to a second IP address that won't be bound to the machine while it's booting. So the switch will stop forwarding the traffic it wasn't expecting until it's up and running syslogd again. Uh, but that was more of just, this will help more in the future after we had solved the, the bootloader problem. 
Uh, another example was a e-commerce store in Europe, uh, and they had a PF-based load balancer in front of their web interface that people went to to, to buy things. Uh, and it turns out that they were getting a particular type of denial of service attack that was exhausting all the resources and causing their website to be down for a couple minutes at a time. Uh, and it turned out that this issue had already been investigated and fixed, but not in the appliance that they had in front of their network. Uh, and so we went through the process of figuring out how to backport that to the right version and build the right new kernel for the appliance they had, even though that was FreeBSD based, but was not vanilla FreeBSD. Uh, and basically, it would end up with a bunch of lingering sockets uh, sitting around and a problem where too many of the interrupts were getting reassigned to uh, hyper threads, not real CPUs, and it was juggling too much. Uh, so we also, I think, added a, a tunable to have some more control over it, although I think that was mostly part of the investigation phase. But with the new tunable and the fixes backported, suddenly people could buy things again, and that makes the customer much happier. <laughs> Another one that I found really interesting is uh, a company that specializes in hardware and software having to do with transportation, uh, including like uh, traffic lights and the crosswatch signals and so on. They have a, a big data system that optimizes snowplow routes for clearing snow off of the roads. And being a big data application, it was written in Perl <laughs> uh, and had a very large memory footprint, uh, which all made sense, but they would report that at certain times, the application would be using a lot of CPU and, and seeming to be working really hard, but never outputting anything. It wasn't actually making any forward progress on its work. It was just burning up a lot of CPU cycles. It wasn't reading or writing or doing anything, just spinning. Uh, and they spent a bunch of time trying to figure it out, and they couldn't, so they came to us. Uh, and a bunch of detracing and other things later, and we figured out uh, the problem was that being Perl developers, when they needed to remove a file, they put in system bin rm path to file. So they were fork and execing their 24 gigabyte of memory Perl program, uh, waiting till it was all copy on writed, and then throw that all away and load bin rm, <laughs> and then exec. Uh, and this was back uh, an older version of FreeBSD before the page daemon uh, was multi-threaded. Uh, so by adding multi-thread or per-domain NUMA version of the page daemon, then suddenly more than one CPU core could be taken care of allocating and, and freeing memory. Uh, and this made their application run much faster and have a lot less of the problem, but wasn't really the right solution to the problem. Right? We, we solved the symptom, but not the problem. And the correct answer to that was to just have the Perl script call unlink the, the syscall rather than fork and exec rm to delete one file. <laughs> and then suddenly when they weren't fork execing their 24 gig of memory application a couple of times a second, then it spent all of its CPU time making work happen, not making memory shuffle back and forth. Uh, and again, that made the application actually work. Uh, so, from all the support cases that we've had and all the things we've helped our customers with, there's a couple of things that we've kind of taken away as lessons learned from that. Uh, obviously the first is, like we talked about, stability. Uh, having FreeBSD be the thing that basically has, as we've talked about many times, the policy of least astonishment. When you do upgrade, something might change and that's okay, right? Uh, policy of least astonishment doesn't mean nothing ever changes. It just means when it does change, it does it in the way that will make sense and maybe be intuitive, not be very surprising to the user. Uh, and that means there aren't gratuitous changes for no reason and that there's a, an uncomplicated path to go from how it used to be to how it is uh, so that they're not just kind of left to their own devices every time they upgrade. And then obviously dependability giving people something they can plan around. Uh, there was a lot of talk at the developer summer earlier 
uh, this week where we talked about can we get to having a schedule for releases. Uh, for example, one of our customers runs uh, you know, the regular stable releases, and so when the next release comes out, you know, 14.1, I think maybe came out yesterday. <laughs> I've been a bit busy. Um, but when that happens, that triggers 14.0 to become end of life three months later. If 14.1 coming out is a surprise to you because you weren't on the FreeBSD developer mailing list and didn't get the reminder about what the schedule is, then three months can be kind of a tough time to schedule operationally to upgrade all your machines to a newer version of FreeBSD. However, if you were told six months ago that we expect 14.1 to come out on this day and at that time you will then have three months to upgrade, that's something they can plan for. And so we've worked with RE and they will be socializing a, a schedule and making that public outside of the FreeBSD developer community but to all the users and the stable mailing list uh, ahead of time. Although Colin's taking it even further and will likely have the schedule for releases for the next couple of years uh, consistently updated so that people can plan even longer term on, you know, we're going to try to base our product on FreeBSD 15 because we know that's going to come out in Q3 of 2025 uh, and that'll be the right time to do it. Uh, the next thing really is, is coverage. FreeBSD can be configured in many different ways. Uh, you know, we have all the source.conf knobs and the, the build options uh, that Dexter tests. And a lot of the non-default options don't actually get tested very well. Uh, I think even yesterday, uh, Mark Johnson was talking about the fact that, you know, we have this SMP option in the kernel for, you know, do you have more than one CPU core? And over time, that kind of became the default, and it turned out nobody was testing without that option. Uh, and then it turns out that code had kind of bit rotted and didn't actually work. And so can we just remove that option and so on? Uh, but some of the much more common but not default configurations could use more testing and just more documentation and coverage. You know, when they are commonly used, uh, not default use cases, uh, the project probably could do more around those to make sure that those things work. Uh, and the kind of tangent to that is the same thing for packages. Uh, for example, there are a lot of people consuming FreeBSD in an environment where Kerberos is important. And can we make flavors of all the ports rather than just options for Kerberos being enabled? Not so much because you know, the, the consumers want to not have to compile their own packages, but because if flavors exist and get built by the official packages, the package fallout mechanism is going to tell the maintainer every time they break something with the Kerberos version of the port. Whereas right now, when it's a non-default option, it doesn't get any kind of compile testing by the, the package building mechanisms. And so if very common alternative configurations of packages uh, could be done as flavors or some other way that means they are part of the regular package build, it will reduce the number of people who have to build their own packages, but more importantly, it will mean those variants actually get tested and problems automatically reported to the maintainer rather than it being on the consumers all the time to find out when they upgrade that the package no longer works. Uh, I think another big example of that one was uh, OpenSSH Portable has support for the GSS API. Uh, and the maintainer seems to accidentally break it every time they update OpenSSH. Uh, and so if we can find and fix a couple more of those to make the experience smoother for the user, I think that would be better. Another big thing is that FreeBSD has to continue to innovate. We've done that well in the past, but maybe we need to just continue to do that. Um, being able to uh, maintain parity with the other popular operating systems, but also offer competitive advantages uh, and things we can do, you know, that will make FreeBSD again stand out over the other options. And then lastly, sustainability. Uh, as with all open source projects, we've seen the trend over the years where, you know, the 
universities and so on that still use it uh, don't really contribute back to open source in the same way as they did in the early days where that was where most of the development and features came from, where the people that use it would contribute back. There's a much more I'm just a user kind of concept now uh, and a lot fewer people giving back. And how do we make sure that all of the different components that make up FreeBSD and all the other upstream projects that we vendor into FreeBSD continue to be maintained and supported uh, so that we don't end up with more issues like the, the uh, LZMA XED thing where there's one maintainer and they're burned out and somebody volunteers to help out uh, with maybe not the best motives. How do we make sure that all of the infrastructure that supports the operating system and that FreeBSD ends up being used as that infrastructure, that it all gets maintained and there aren't components that are getting left behind because you know, there was one person and they're too busy now or they're not around anymore or whatever happens. So how do we continue to maintain the, the long-term sustainability of each of these components? So yeah, the most common asks were definitely, again, using flavors and so on to make sure that non-standard package options actually get tested uh, or built upstream um, and just more careful and sustainable ports updates. Uh, like a lot of us, most of the, the downstream consumers we work with are using Poudreur to build their own packages out of the port tree, but every time they update to a newer port tree, there's a bunch of things that don't work anymore. And usually it's only a little bit of work to go and smooth over its edges and figure out what was slightly broken or different uh, and get it working again, but spending that little bit of time at each downstream all the time uh, seems like something we might be able to do better upstream. And maybe that's, you know, coming back to the old complaint of how do we get CI kind of like red ports used to be. Uh, that's so long ago, I don't know if anybody actually remembers how red ports worked anymore. <laughs> uh, and a more predictable release cycle, although I think Colin and the new release engineering team have that under control now. Uh, but then, uh, as we also talked about at the developer summit, um, the FreeBC project having more of a roadmap and communicating that better. Uh, so that's something that's going to be undertaken by the, the next core team. Uh, if you're a FreeBSD developer and you haven't voted for the core team election yet, you only have like four more days, so please stop procrastinating and do that. Uh, and then lastly is more standard procedures. One of the kind of idiosyncrasies of FreeBSD is there are usually at least three different ways to do anything whether that's which firewall to use or which way to do jails or which way to do boot environments or whatever. More documentation about one of those. So, you know, we can continue to have those options because they're usually a reason when somebody has a use case that that option makes sense, but more recommendations for people using FreeBSD on this is the, the most well-worn path or this is the one that's most commonly going to fit your use case. Uh, so policies around uh, which tools to use and how to do it, whether it's the right kind of a, a standard upgrade mechanism for appliances or the right way to implement secure boot and very exact or all of these different pieces that a lot of downstream vendors that use FreeBSD are doing themselves over and over again. If we could document the recommended way to do that for more of them, then I think we could get more people on the same path and get that path to be smoother for all of us. And then packages. Uh, I know this came up recently. I forget which package it was this time that just failed to build during the most recent build of the uh, AMD64 packages. And so when you try to package install it, you would get told, there's no such package as that. You know, Firefox never existed. You're imagining things. <laughs> uh, if we could fix that so that when a package were to fail to build, you would at least get a message saying that yeah, Firefox is temporarily unavailable because it failed to build, rather than there's no such thing as Firefox and there never has been. <laughs> we get a lot less 1984 feeling from that. Uh, and can we improve the testing of packages? Uh, most of the software that we package had some kind of tests of its own. Can we do some of that to have our packages be more than, 
Well, they compiled, so it probably works. Here, have it. Uh, and can we constrain the combinatorics of port options? Uh, you know, when we were talking about having a flavor to, to make sure that some of these non-common build options get built, when you look at something like Nginx that has more than 64 different individual options you can turn on and off, the combinations of that is more than the 18 quintillion uh, options you have. It would use more than 64 bits worth of numbers to express all of the possible combinations you could do. Uh, I'm not saying we need to test all of those, but having something so that we can make sure a bit more of that is actually covered. Another question that's come up is, is there value in maintaining archives of old packages? For example, you know, when 11.4 went EOL, shortly after Clusterman deleted the latest package build for that, uh, because our CDN, uh, internally built CDN that distributes packages is all on SSDs to make it performant enough, but that means we are kind of space constrained. So in order to be able to support having packages for 14.1, we had to remove 11.4. But maybe on a slower mirror somewhere, would it be beneficial to keep around the packages from old versions of FreeBSD? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, sometimes our advice to people with really old computers is go use the matching old version of FreeBSD, but can you do that if there's no matching software for it? Or even just as we continue to work on reproducible builds, you might need tools and things that came from that version that were you know, contemporary at that time. And if that was eight years ago, that might be hard to come by. Uh, but if that would be especially useful to places, maybe we can find some way to, to fund having that archive. Like it's not going to be stupendously expensive, but it is that much more storage space and hardware that has to be maintained long term uh, to keep that archive. And how much archive should we keep? Uh, do we just keep the last package build for every stable branch, or do we actually keep the last package build for every release? Or what, what is the right granularity there? Uh, and kind of building on the point we talked about earlier, having more prepackaged solutions for common requirements, whether that is, you know, how to customize the loader menu to put your logo in, or how to have an upgrader, a, a fail-safe upgrade mechanism, which is kind of a pet project of mine that I've been working on for quite a while, but all the common things that everybody that deploys FreeBSD at scale or builds an appliance on FreeBSD or does anything else that three other people in FreeBSD do, can we have more of a, there's already a solution for this, this is the best solution. You can do whatever you want, but there's one you can have for free if you just want to do what everybody else is doing. So whether that's how to build custom images for your hardware and your VMs, or how to make an EC2 image of your appliance uh, that's based on FreeBSD and get it into AWS, uh, or whatever else you might want to do, and having common ways to do that. Image building, like we talked about. Uh, but also, you know, security and authentication. How do you make sure that the update that is being sent to your appliance is genuine and came from you, not isn't malicious or corrupted. And how do you make immutable systems? Like I said, the, the one we developed really depends on nobody's ever going to run untrusted code on this machine, which maybe is not as strong as other people's requirements might have. And so how do we build standard ways to do these things that a lot of us all need to, to do? And then another question is, with some of the kind of feeder projects that feed into FreeBSD's user base uh, moving away, should we, you know, as, as Pavel and I were talking about, should we maybe take that opportunity to pick some kind of appliance to build as a kind of technology demonstrator of the right way to use all of these common bits to build an appliance uh, so that we've mapped out all the pieces and all the components so that 
when somebody wants to build their own appliance based on FreeBSD, we kind of have this recipe book for them. So, you know, we've often said that FreeBSD is like the, the Lego set, but it tends not to come with a little book that tells you how to put the pieces together. <laughs> so if we could make that little book, that could be uh, very valuable. And again, further improve that time to market where somebody can take an idea and turn it into a working FreeBSD appliance in less time. Because again, they want to focus on what their product does, not the operating system that sits underneath that makes it possible. Any questions before I get into story time? Okay, so I have a couple of stories I can share here. Uh, so one that we did that was interesting uh, was there's a, a regional election authority uh, that does you know, electronic voting and they do this over networks to collect data from the polling stations back to the central office. Um, and they use OpenBGPD on FreeBSD to manage that traffic, but also uh, with a feature called FlowSpec where they can send pattern matching rules for the traffic to their upstreams and say, if somebody tries to send us a message uh, over UDP on port 80, that's probably a denial of service attack, not real traffic. Please don't forward that across our link uh, that will maybe can get saturated by this denial of service attack. Uh, and so this project, in fact, involved updating OpenBGPD to actually work with FreeBSD's newer networking stack. Uh, the routing interfaces changed, I think, in FreeBSD 12, uh, and OpenBGPD had never been updated to, to work with that, so we solved that, and then worked with OpenBSD developers to add the FlowSec support and get that upstream. And so now modern versions of OpenBGPD work properly on FreeBSD and have these additional features, uh, but also it means that the firewalls running FreeBSD make sure that elections continue to happen fairly. Um, we had a, a different consumer electronics manufacturer uh, that was using FreeBSD for their appliance and they had a slightly interesting situation where there were I think three or four network interfaces on the appliance uh, and they needed DHCP to work on more than one of them at a time. Uh, well, you can kind of do that with, by default uh, but the problem is after the first one gets its information and updates your DNS server and your, your default gateway, when the second one negotiates DHCP with its server, it's going to overwrite those DNS settings and the, change your default gateway again. Uh, so we extended the uh, DHCP client in FreeBSD uh, with some configuration options that say, on this interface, ignore these certain options. So it can configure the IP address on the second interface but will not take the DNS server or the default route from that second interface. And then again for the third, allowing them to use DHCP on all the interfaces without having the problem of that breaking access to the internet. Because uh, you know, the port that's labeled internet is the one they want to actually take the default route from. This also had the side effect of offering FreeBSD uh, a mitigation to the, the recent VPN uh, vulnerability where you know, if you're getting on the Wi-Fi at Starbucks, uh, somebody could have a rogue DHCP server that adds a more specific route for, you know, the common internal subnets uh, so that when you connect to your VPN, traffic actually routed over the VPN was actually being sent to the attacker local at Starbucks rather than actually going across your VPN. Uh, I think it was option 120 in DHCP, something like that. Uh, but this... Configuration option we added allows you to say, hey, ignore those options on my Wi-Fi interface. My Wi-Fi should never be adding additional static routes to my machine. Uh, in another case, we had a cloud provider uh, who was using Dell hardware, and Dell has in their new machines this kind of adding card called BOSS, which is a, where they put two uh, NVMe drives like the, the gumstick ones for the operating system install. Uh, and that did work fine for quite a while, but then as part of their regular maintenance, they installed the firmware update from Dell. 
and suddenly you couldn't boot from that device anymore. The device would just disappear and you wouldn't even have your boot disks anymore. Uh, it turned out uh, that during the firmware update they had changed something and the device now took a lot longer to initialize. Uh, so we ended up having to add a, a quirk for that specific hardware to the AHCI driver uh, to make it wait a little bit longer before giving up on that device so that your boot disk would show up again. Uh, in another case with a different customer, um, they found that the LSI HBA storage driver, uh, somebody had helpfully done a bunch of work to, to make it work on Power 9, uh, which is big Indian. And it turned out they hadn't done the byte swapping of one field quite right. And this meant that on x86, it was byte swapping at the wrong granularity. Uh, and suddenly, one of these devices wouldn't show up. But it was a weird configuration in that they were using the, the card in HBA mode, not the RAID controller mode, but they were doing a mirrored volume in hardware. Uh, I didn't even know that was a thing, but apparently that's something the LSI device can do. But the bug in the end again swap only affected that use case. So this had been broken in the LSI driver for months or even a year, uh, but it didn't impact most people because and you use the hard drives individually, you don't run in, you don't take that code path that has the problem. Uh, because it's with the volume enumeration, which doesn't happen if you're just passing through whole hard drives. Uh, and so chasing that down and fixing it uh, was a very interesting exercise, uh, especially without local access to hardware that, to, that created that same configuration. But that was another one that we did that was quite interesting. All right, we're at the end now. Does anybody have any more questions? No questions. Yep. Uh, so the question is, do we see people using Beehive in the field and do we support it? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we have uh, a number of people, we've helped people transition away from VMware to Beehive, um, or just in general do more with Beehive and extend it. And uh, we also helped contribute to getting the ARM 64 version of Beehive working, since we have a couple of those big Ampere machines that we could lend to the effort. Uh, so yeah, we help, I think at least eight customers uh, use Beehive, uh, some of them just because they want to, and some of them as a, a replacement for other solutions that were not as good. Uh, did you have a specific question about Beehive? Or? Uh, so the question is, has anybody been dying for live migration? Um, not especially. Um, that may have more to do with that we generally recommend building your infrastructure in such a way that you can tolerate the failure of a node, um, and that you know just rebooting the VM on a different compute node uh, usually is better than depending on being able to live migrate the machine to another node with zero downtime. Uh, so if you build your infrastructure better, you don't have to depend on such a complicated, you know, easily broken mechanism. Not to say that people wouldn't rather have it. Uh, but most of the times we've been able to kind of work around the requirement and provide something that works as well. And, you know, the goal usually is that the user doesn't notice an interruption, not that there isn't an interruption, if that makes sense. So I think lots of us would like my live migration, but there's usually other ways around it that mean that it's not as pressing of an issue. Any other questions? Uh, so the question is, are, do we have any kind of failure stories of, of companies that were using FreeBSD and switched away 
uh, because of some reason that we might be able to learn from. Very early on at Clara, we encountered a few of those, uh, more in the case of Clara arrived just too late. Uh, one of them was FedEx, uh, who ended up with a mandate that they can only use software where they could buy a support subscription. Uh, and you know, if Clara had existed a year earlier, we maybe could have saved them, uh, but we didn't at the time, so it hadn't. Um, we have encountered at least two cases where a company was planning to move from FreeBSD to Linux, and then after investigating what it would take, decided maybe that wasn't such a good idea, or that you know, the support we could provide meant that they wouldn't have to undertake all that effort. Uh, because in the end, when, you know, when you're building an appliance that's doing something for a customer, the customer's not gonna care what operating system's underneath. So if you spend your engineering effort switching to a different platform, but without that offering something to the customer, the customer's like, well, I, so you, you didn't do the feature I wanted because you were switching operating system? <laughs> um, don't have any examples like that off the top of my head, uh, which I guess is a good thing, but I do know that the, those stories are out there. Uh, sadly, kind of the nature of, of open source and BSD is that half the time we don't, we didn't know they were using FreeBSD in the first place, and they don't come and tell us, hey, we're leaving, and this is why. Uh, it would be nice to have more post-mortems post -mortems like that. And I guess uh, IX is maybe the only one I can really think of. Okay. Don't be shy, ask a question. <laughs> been sort of collecting this repertoire of customer needs, has it led you to any, I don't know, enhancements to get for FreeBSD itself? Yeah, um, a lot of those we've implemented. Uh, the one we have uh, that I've been promising for a while but should actually learn quite soon is uh, CDN support for PKG. Uh, so we've built it so that Cludrier will rename the packages so that they have the first so many characters of the SHA-256 in the name of the package so that it does the automatic cache busting we would need to be able to use Amazon CloudFront or Fastly or whatever CDN in front that might solve the problem of we can only host so many gigabytes of data or terabytes of data on our package mirrors because they have to be all high-speed NVMe, otherwise we can't serve enough IOPS to keep everything happy. Whereas if we could offload some of that to you know, optimize CDNs, A, probably provides better download speeds in Australia and Asia and, and elsewhere, but also um, might mean that we cannot have to use such expensive storage and maybe be able to expand the, the width of what files we can host for both the pre-built images uh, and the, the ISOs and so on and the packages. Uh, but if only they give us more concrete solutions like that or suggestions like that. So Pablo asks, what are the factors that companies are considering when looking at maybe switching to FreeBSD and maybe when they decide not to, what were the reasons? Um, I know especially one of the things that led us to starting Clara was hearing vendors say, you know, we'd like to switch to FreeBSD or we're using it and we'd like to stay on it, but we can't find enough developers. And then on the other corner of the same room, there are a bunch of developers being like, I wish I had a day job that didn't involve working on Linux uh, and seeing what we can do to, to maybe level that out a bit. Um, but looking at the companies that are trying to switch, I think most of the ones we've ended up dealing with have, have made the switch, uh, but that's partly just because those are the people that are coming and finding us. Um, but yeah, it would be good to have more of a, like the, the list I presented were some of the reasons that they did switch, but finding some of the reasons they didn't. Um, some of that maybe is, you know, we lack a certain ABI or feature that their application uses. Like, uh, you know, iNotify has been talked about to death. Um, some of it is just, you know, there's, People feel more comfort using the thing that everybody uses. 
uh, and sometimes it's you know trying to make the counter argument about monocultures and so on. But to some people, that argument isn't strong enough. Um, but yeah, I would love to learn more about places that didn't switch and why. But those are often the hardest people to get to tell you anything because they decided not to go with you, so they they don't want to spend any time explaining why. Thanks, everyone. Oh, one more question. How do they know FreeBSD? How do our customers find FreeBSD? Yeah. The consumer electronics place was, they happened to have a gray beard on staff. The research place was gray beard. Uh, yeah, a little bit of everything. Um, I think we need to continue to do the evangelism. Things like the podcast help a lot, uh, but also presenting about FreeBSD at conferences that aren't about FreeBSD. Uh, so, you know, like I went to the open source firmware conference and presented there, but also just other events that are kind of adjacent, but not necessarily as specific and wouldn't necessarily know that FreeBSD is an option. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things Clara is working on is expanding towards more embedded things. Uh, and being like, you know, when you're building an appliance where you're not necessarily, the, the operating system isn't fundamental to what the appliance does, but you need an operating system. Hey, there's this option that's not Linux that'll let you get to market faster, be more sustainable, uh, and have a license that will less complicate your life uh, can be a really powerful message, but you have to get that message in front of the people that are didn't know they were looking for it. Uh, so the question is, if we get a sizable number of, of custom kernel development requests from customers, uh, yeah, we do uh, quite a number of projects. Uh, some of the things that we've done that are upstreamed, you might have seen, were tarfs support, um, the restricted version of the debugger. Uh, so we did a, a Mac module that allows you to restrict what commands you can use in the kernel debugger when the system crashes, so that they could leave the debugger enabled in the appliance in the field, so they can get back traces and inspect things, but uh, you know, a hostile person in front of the console of the appliance can't dump the private VPN keys out of memory. Uh, so it lets you run only the debugger commands that don't let you go off into just unknown memory uh, and restrict it. Uh, we did live dump support. Uh, so another customer has an HA failover system, and when it gets in a split brain, it will now dump core without rebooting on both nodes so they can go back and figure out why it got in split brain without you know, the fact that, oh, we rebooted to fix it and now all the evidence is gone. Um, and then we did compiler stuff, KAMSAN uh, and KASAN uh, support for ARM64 uh, and a bunch of other things like that. And also sometimes the vendor has a feature they developed themselves and we just help them get it upstream which sometimes means expanding it and generalizing it to make it useful beyond their specific use case of their product and making it something everyone can use. And then ZFS features, we built lots and lots of those, uh, including an early version of the one Pavel did for hierarchical rate limits. The more limited initial version of that was, was for a Clara customer. And we did fast dedupe with IX. All right, thanks everyone.